Hello, I am Baal Kadmon, and I would like to thank you for watching and or listening to this podcast. So today I'm going to read you a chapter of a book that is going to come out within the next few weeks. Wow, it's a long ass book. Let me tell you, it's already past 200 pages. I'm not even finished yet. So what you're going to hear today is really just a rough draft of one of these chapters. I, I might even add to it. I probably will. So I took a poll uh, the other day to see what chapter you would you all want me to read. And I mentioned one about how the demonic idea presented itself in Jewish literature and rabbinic literature and about the klipot and the sitra achra. I was actually very surprised. I was expecting the Klipot and the Sitra Achra to be the most popular, but it wasn't. Actually, A was the one that everyone picked. So today, that's what I'm going to be reading uh, to you. Uh, and let me just tell you, it is a little long and it is a little odd, okay, because rabbinic literature is not, um, how can I put this, uh, it's not always clear. It's, it's very convoluted. But before I get into that, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, this book that I'm releasing. It's going to be released, like I said, within the next two weeks. It's called Devils, Demons, and Ghosts in the Hebrew Tradition, Romancing the Sitra Achra. In it, I'm going to be covering uh, how the demonic idea developed, starting with the Old Testament, and I would just like to mention that this is not a book about the history of Jewish magic. It is the history about demons and ghosts in the Hebrew tradition. There will be magic in the books. I'm pro providing plenty of rituals at the end of the book. But this is not about Jewish magic as it is about Jewish uh, conception of spirits and demons. Uh, we will also be covering uh, demonic uh, ideas in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, the various different ideas about demons and ghosts in the uh, rabbinic tradition, that's including the Kabbalah. Uh, you will learn uh, more, I mean, I'm going to mention Lilith, because Lilith is a very prominent figure in this uh, aspect of Judaism, but you're going to learn about other uh, feminine spirits that are also considered demonic, uh, that many people don't know, but some people do, and I was actually quite shocked, but a lot of people don't. I will un I will explain how the Sitra Achra came to be from the moment of creation, so you'll learn about the Klipot and how they um, uh, correspond with the Sitra Achra, and I am going to be using very obscure documents for this, and a lot of it is very counter to a lot of the things that you see in the occult tradition nowadays spreading about the Svirot and and the Sitra Achra and the Klipot, those, everything that you're reading now is very contemporary. But in this book, I will show you where these ideas really came from and how different they actually are from what is being taught to get, uh, today. Uh, of course, I will be accessing, you know, Hebrew and Aramaic texts uh, as needed. Um, I will present them. And sometimes I don't present them if they're not required for my point. And of course, I'm going to be adding some very powerful meditations and rituals. And let me just tell you, there, this is not the Goetia, okay? This, this is far more intense than that. So I do hope you enjoy it. I'm going to be reading the chapter, Demons and Ghosts in the Post-Biblical Period, Part 1, Foundational Demonics. Let's get to it. Demons and Ghosts in the Post-Biblical Period, Part 1, Foundational Demonics We will now move away from the Old Testament for a few chapters and venture off into rabbinic literature and other Jewish texts that will provide some clarity on some things that the Old Testament does not. Please understand, when I say it provides clarity, I don't mean it will make this topic easier to understand. Uh, rabbinic literature and post-biblical texts are quite convoluted. However, they do at least give us some backstory and anecdotal information regarding many of the demonic and ghostly entities we have and will encounter going forward. 
In order to understand how the demonological ideas crept into Judaism, we must look to ancient Babylon and Mesopotamian beliefs as a whole. Many wrongly believe that ancient Egypt had more influence on Hebrew religion and beliefs because of the, the fact that the Hebrews were enslaved in Egypt for a few generations. I see why some would think this. After all, the foundation of Judaism is the out-of-Egypt narrative. Judaism wouldn't even exist without it. However, what we find is that ancient Egyptian belief systems itself barely influenced the Hebrew religion, if at all. Even the ancient Egyptian language is very different from Hebrew. Its morphological repertoire is hardly related to the Hebrew language, even though they are both considered quote-unquote Afro-Asiatic languages. You would be hard-pressed to find much there that is ancient Egyptian, both in belief and linguistically. What you will find is heavy influence from the Canaanite and Mesopotamian beliefs. I will only discuss the Mesopotamian briefly in this book because it has a direct influence on many beliefs that crept into Rabbinic Judaism, and by extension, modern Judaism when it comes to demons and spirits. Whereas the Canaanite influence was mostly biblical in nature, most influences staying in the Bible, with little to no influence on the rabbinic and latter-day Jewish concepts regarding demons and the occult. How did Mesopotamian beliefs enter Judaism? The answer begins to unfold during the Babylonian exile, during and after the Babylonian captivity of 609 BC to about 515 BC. The Jewish people started to incorporate and assimilate many beliefs from Babylonia. Judaism develops in its belief system four main demonological classes, whereas in the Bible they weren't put into organized classes. The classes are mainly the Shedim, the Ruchin, Lilin, and the Mazikin. There are a few more, and we will discuss those shortly. Another more important development in Jewish thinking came when a clear definition of good and evil started to develop. This occurred at the tail end of the Babylonian captivity when the Persians conquered Babylon. Now, under Persian rule, the Jewish people were exposed to the concept of good and evil in the Persian belief system, mainly that of Ahura Mazda or Muzd and Aha Ahriman Angramanyu both deities found in Zurvanism and later Zoroastrianism. Ahura Mazda represents the good and the light, and Ahriman represents the evil and the dark. The Babylonian exile left a lasting impression on the Jewish people, and in time, a very large Jewish population developed there. Some of these communities can trace back to the Babylonian exile itself, while some move back there after the fall of the Second Temple. While in Iraq, quote-unquote Babylon, the rabbis and scholars started to codify and elucidate many of the laws contained in the Torah, or the first five books of Moses. In time, the text would be known as the Babylonian Talmud. At the same time, the Jews that were left in Jerusalem, or Palestine, were doing the same thing. Their version of the Talmud is called the Jerusalem Talmud, and sometimes the Palestinian Talmud. In modern Jewish scholarship and in religious circles, the Babylonian Talmud is the one people most refer to. You can read more about this in my book, The Talmud, an Occultist Introduction. In the Talmudic literature, especially the version of the Talmud that came from Babylon, we see quite a bit on demons and spirits. Much of it harkens back to the Babylonian exile, like I mentioned before. The Jerusalem or Palestinian Talmud, however, is surprisingly devoid of any information on demons and angels. Lewis Ginsburg, in his book, The Palestinian Talmud, states, Palestinian authors of the Talmud excluded almost entirely the popular fancies about angels and demons, while in Babylonia, angelology and demonology gained scholastic recognition, and with it, entrance into the Talmud. A similar observation can be made in regard to the difference in attitudes of the two Talmuds towards sorcery, magic, astrology, and other kinds of superstition. Here is an example of this. In the Babylonian Talmud, in Gitin 68a, it states, It is written, I got myself Sha'arim and Sharot, and human pleasures, Shida and Shidot. The Talmud explains, Sha'arim and Sharot, these are the types of musical instruments and human pleasures. These are the pools and bathhouses. Whereas Shida and Shidot, 
Here in Babylonia, they are interpreted these words as being male demons, shida, and female demons, shidetin. In the West, or the Palestinian Talmud, they said that these words are referring to carriages, shideta. Here you can see that the rabbis of the Babylonian tradition make mention of how the rabbis of the Palestinian Talmud interpreted the words for demons as carriages in this particular scenario. It is almost as if the rabbis of Jerusalem didn't want to have anything to do with demonology or similar topics. I personally side with the Babylonian rabbis here because it states Shida and Shidot, clearly referring to a male and female aspect. Last time I checked, I don't recall carriages having a gender. It just doesn't make sense. I'm not sure, I'm not saying that the, the Jerusalem Talmud doesn't reference humans at all, but it is far more subdued than the Babylonian Talmud. Unlike the Old Testament, the Babylonian Talmud goes into detail as to how demons came to be. Unfortunately, it is not uniform, but it is interesting nonetheless. The source texts for the Talmudic verses in Hebrew, Aramaic, and English are derived from sepharia.org one of the only sites I know of that does a great job at translating from the original texts. Before I go into the various descriptions of how demons came to be, let us look at the Talmud regarding how the rabbis view demons in general. Now, the texts that I am quoting from are clearly you know, Jewish in nature, and many people may not know what they are. I do have a chapter in the book explaining each of these books, but for now, let me just quote them directly, and when you get the book, you can look up what each of these books are and what, what they're about. Babylonian Talmud, Chagiga 16a and Avot de Rabbi Natan 37. The rabbis taught six things were said about demons three in which they resemble ministering angels, and three in which they resemble human beings. The three that resemble angels have wings. They fly from one end of the earth to another, and they know the future. And the three that resemble humans eat and drink and have offspring and die. We see here that the demons fall under two main categories. Unfortunately, it is not quite so clear-cut as the above verse states. It is far messier. Let us take a look at what the texts say regarding how demons form and are created. How demons came to be. In the Talmud, there are several ways demons came into being. I will also add a few more other rabbinic texts in the Zohar, a Kabbalistic text that includes many of the same rabbis that are present in the Talmud. I will go more in depth on the Kabbalah later in this book. Demon Origin 1. An attractate of the Talmud Pesachim 54a, it states, The sages taught, Ten phenomena were created on Shabbat Eve during twilight, and they were Miriam's well, mana, and the rainbow, writing, and the writing instrument, and the tablets, the grave of Moses, and the cave in which Moses and Elijah stood, the opening of the mouth of Bilam's donkey, and the opening of the mouth of the earth to swallow the wicked in the time of Korach. And some say that even Aaron's staff was created then, and its almonds and its blossoms. Some say that even demons were created at this time. In the Hebrew Aramaic, the term for demons is mazikin. The term mazikin means to bother or to harm. It is interesting to note that according to the rabbis here, these demons were created on the Sabbath Eve, way before the angels fell, supposedly. I will get into that and why that's significant later in the book. Demon Origin 2 In the Talmudic tractate Eruvin 18b, it states that several different types of demons were created from the wasted sperm of Adam, the first man. Let's take a look. Rabbi Yeremia ben Elazar said, All those years during which Adam was ostracized for his sin involving the tree of knowledge, he bore spirits and demons and female demons. When Rabbi Yeremiah made his statement, he meant that those destructive creatures were formed from the semen that Adam accidentally emitted, which brought the destructive creatures into being. In the Aramaic, the term for demons are used as such, Ruchin, Shidin, and Lilin. And these are essentially spirits, demons, and night demons, or Lilin, the class of demons Lilith comes from. 
In the Zohar, it states that he wasted his seed after leaving the Garden of Eden, but rather he united with uh, Lilith, reunited that is, and they spawned these demons together. Demon Origin 3. In Tractate Baba Kama 16a, it states that a male hyena <laughs> over several years turns into a demon. Yes, I know, that's, that's ridiculous, but here's what it says. A male hyena, after seven years, changes into an insect-eating bat. An insect-eating bat, after seven years, changes into a, a herbivorous bat. A herbivorous bat, after seven years, changes into a thistle. A thistle, after seven years, changes into a briar. And a briar, after seven years, changes into a demon. If you think the above is strange, the rest of that passage that I did not provide here is even stranger. It states that a person who did not bow during certain prayers would have his spine turn into a snake seven years after death. Yeah, it's, it's strange stuff, and to think this is the least of it. The Talmud is very strange place, stranger than you can imagine. Demon Origin 4. In the Zohar, 129a, it states, in the name of Rabbi Yehuda, that the souls of the wicked are the demons of the world. And here they're using the Aramaic term mazikin, which again means to bother or harm. Demon Origin 5. This may not be an exactly a demon class in the rabbinic text, but it sort of is. Uh, Pirkei Avot, chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Rabbi Eliezer, the son of Yaakov, would say, He who fulfills one good deed acquires for himself one angel advocate. He who commits one transgression acquires against him one angel accuser. So, this angel accuser is possibly a demon type of being. Since we know Satan is an accuser, as is Belial in the rabbinic text, it makes sense to me that this angel accuser might be a demon, even if, he, if he's transient. Demon Origin 6 In the Talmudic text Sanhedrin 107b, it states, The members of the generation of the flood, Noah's Ark, Noah's flood, have no share in the world to come and will not stand in judgment at the end of days. As it is stated, My soul shall not abide in man forever. Neither will they stand in judgment, nor shall their souls be restored to them. The above text is essentially saying that all those who died during the flood in the book of Genesis will not be going to heaven. Some rabbis interpreted this passage to mean that the souls of these people become demons and therefore their souls would not be resurrected or restored. The rationale is, is that they were just too wicked and don't deserve it. Moving on. Demons pervaded the worldview of the rabbis of the Babylonian Talmudic era. Demons were everywhere and would inject themselves into every situation. The Talmud makes this very clear. In Brachot 6a and b, it says, Abba Benjamin says, If the eye had the power to see demons, no creature could endure them. Abaya says, They are more numerous than we are. They surround us like the ridge around a field. Rav Huna says, Everyone among us has at least a thousand demons on his left and ten thousand on his right. Rava says, they were responsible for the crushing of the Kala lectures, fatigue in the knees, the wearing out of clothes of the scholars from rubbing against them, and the bruising of the feet. If one wants to discover them, let him take sifted ashes and sprinkle around his bed, and in the morning he will see something like the footprints of a rooster. If one wishes to see them, let him take the afterbirth of a black she-cat, which is the offspring of a black she-cat, the firstborn of a firstborn, roast it in fire and grind it to a powder, and then let him put some of this in his eye, and he will see them. Let him also pour it into an iron tube and seal it with an iron signet, that they should not steal it from him, and let him also close his mouth, so that he should not come to harm. That passage alone illustrates just how much thought has been given to the prevalence of demons in this worldview. They were everywhere. With 
This demon haunted worldview. Various remedies would be prescribed. Many address the demons that cause them directly. Uh, let's look at a few of them. Shabbat 67a. To be saved from a demon, let him recite the following. You were stopped up, stopped up you were, cursed, broken, and excommunicated by the demon called Bar Tit Bar Tame Bartina, and Shamgaz, Mirigaz, and Esternai. To be saved from the demon of the bathroom, let him recite the following. On the head of a lion and on the nose of a lioness, we found the demon named Bal Shirika Panda. With a bed of leeks, I felled him, and with the jaw of the donkey, I struck him. Okay, that's pretty strange. Uh, continuing on in the subject of bathrooms and demons, there's a lot more. Brachot 62a, Rabbi Tanhum Bar Hanilai said, Anyone who is modest in the bathroom will be saved from three things. From snakes, from scorpions, and from demons. And some say that even his dreams will be settled for him. There was a particular bathroom in the city of Tiberias where when two people would enter it during the day, they would be harmed by demons. When Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi would enter each alone, they were not harmed. The sages said to them, Aren't you afraid? Rabbi Ami and Rabbi Asi said to them, We have learned through tradition. The tradition is to avoid danger in the bathrooms is to conduct oneself with modesty and silence. Abaya's mother raised a lamb to accompany him to the bathroom. The Talmud objects. She should have raised a goat for him. A goat would be interchanged with a goat demon. What on God's green earth is going on here? <laughs> These words may sound amusing to us because they don't make much sense. However, they took this very seriously in this time period. Conversing with the Devil in some instances, demons would speak directly to certain rabbis, as we see in Pesachim 110b. Rab Yosef said, Yosef the demon said to me, Ashmedai, the king of the demons, is appointed over all who perform actions in pairs. As you can see, a demon by the name of Joseph spoke to Rabbi Joseph regarding the actions of the king of demons Ashmedai. Ashmedai is the original spelling and pronunciation of the demon Asmadius. I will discuss him later in the book, and I'll also discuss the whole Paris thing later as well. This is not the only instance in which the rabbi spoke with demons. Uh, let us look at Chulin 105b. There were certain porters who were carrying a barrel of wine. When they wanted to rest, they placed it under a gutter, and the barrel burst. They came before Mar Bar Rav Ashi, who brought out horns and had them blow it as he excommunicated the demons of that place. The demon came before Mar Bar Rav Ashi, and the sages said to him, Why did you do this? The demon said to him, How else should I act when these men place a barrel on my ear? Mar Bar Rav Ashi said to him, What are you doing in a place where many people are found? You are the one who deviated from the norm. Go and pay them the value of the barrel of wine. The demon said to him, Let the master now set a time for me so that I can find the money and I will pay. Mar Bar Rav Ashi set a time for his payment. When that time arrived, the demon delayed in coming to pay. When the demon eventually came, Mar Bar Rav Ashi said to him, Why did you not come at the time set for you? The demon said to him, With regard to any item that is tied up, or sealed, or measured, or counted, we have no authority to take it. We are unable to obtain money until we find an ownerless item. For this reason, it took him a long time to find enough money to pay for the barrel. Yevamot 122a They heard a disembodied voice, but went and found no one there. Perhaps it was a demon. Rav Yehuda said to Rav, said, They saw that he had the form of a person, so they knew it was not a demon. The Talmud asks, They, i.e. demons, also appear similar to people. The Talmud answers, They saw that he had a shadow. The Talmud asks, But they also have a shadow. 
the Talmud answers, it was a case where they saw that he had a shadow of a shadow. The Talmud asks, but perhaps they also have a shadow of a shadow. Rabbi Hanina said, Yonatan, the demon expert, said to me, they have a shadow, but they do not have a shadow of a shadow. Interesting passage, to say the least. It appears that the rabbis of this era had several communications and conversations with demons as if they were just everyday folk. Uh, what I find amusing in many of these interactions is that the demons have such normal and regular names like Joseph and Jonathan. <laughs> Here's another account of demon speaking. It is in the following passage we also see the name Ashmadai once again. We see in the Talmud, Gittin 68a and b, that King Solomon was seeking out something called a Shamir. The Shamir is one of the most enigmatic creatures in the Talmud. It is essentially a worm-like creature that was used to cut the blocks used for the temple. Apparently, the source and location of the Shamir was known by Ashmodai. Let us look in Gittin 68a. Solomon brought a male demon and a female demon and tormented them together. And they said, We do not know where to find the Shamir. Perhaps Ashmodai, the king of demons, knows. Here we see that King Solomon had control over demonic entities. This is in line with the tradition about him, a tradition that has been consistent throughout time and across the Abrahamic religions. Let us take a look at other ideas and encounters these rabbis had with and regarding demons. In Kedushin 29b it states, Abaya heard that Rav Aha bar Yaakov was coming. There was a certain demon in the study hall of Abaya which was so powerful that when two people would enter, they would be harmed, even during the day. Abaya said to the people of the town, Do not give Rav Ahab bar Yaakov lodging so that he will be forced to spend the night in the study hall. Since Rav Ahab bar Yaakov is a righteous man, perhaps a miracle will, will occur on his behalf and he will kill the demon. Rav Ahab found no place to spend that night and he entered and spent the night in the study hall of the sages. The demon appeared to him like a serpent with seven heads. Rav Ahabar Yaakov began to pray, and with every bow that he bowed, one of the demon's heads fell off until it eventually died. The next day, Rav Aha said to the townspeople, If a miracle had not occurred, you would have placed me in danger. The Talmud contains several passages that serve as warnings to people regarding demons and where they can be found. Here are a few examples. The passages you're about to hear and read are mind-numbing and quite absurd. Here we go. With regard to one who relieves himself between a palm tree and a wall, we said that he places himself in danger only when there are not four cubits, six feet, of space between the two objects, the palm tree and the wall. However, if there are four cubits, six feet, we have no problem with it. The demons have enough room to pass, and we will not obstruct them. And furthermore, even when there are not six feet or four cubits, we said there is a problem only when the demons have no other routes besides that one. However, if they have another route, we have no problem with it, and with regard to one who passes between two palm trees, we said that he is in danger only if a public domain does not cross between them. However, if a public domain crosses between them, we have no problem with it, as demons are not permitted to cause harm in public places. The next two passages contain various locations to which demons flock to. Brachot 39a and b. The sages taught, for three reasons one may not enter a ruin, because of suspicion of prostitution, because the ruin is liable to collapse, and because of demons. Chagiga 3b With regard to one who sleeps in the cemetery, one could say that he is doing so in order that an impure spirit should settle upon him. It is interesting to note that the two scenarios above are very reminiscent of where the jinn reside as well. I would not be surprised if these uh, passages were directly influenced by jinn tradition that was prevalent in Arab lore, uh, not only in pre-Islam, but especially post-Islam and, of course, in Iraq itself. 
Let me discuss a few other passages that deal with the locations in which demons reside. You will see just how uncomfortable these rabbis were during this time period. The rabbis were very specific as to where demons reside and the timing in which they were more likely to appear. There is a story about a town called Shechin that had about 300 demons at its doorstep. In Gitin 68a it states, Rabbi Yochanan says, there were 300 types of demons in a place called Shechin, but I do not know what the form or nature of the demons are themselves. Here the passage in Aramaic is using the term Shedim for demons. It isn't clear why Shechin has 300 demons. However, the verse goes on to discuss more about the demons as they pertain to Solomon. I will touch upon that later in the book. This next one is amusing to me. It's Megillah 3a. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Levi says, Prohibited for a person to greet his fellow at night if he does not recognize him, as we are concerned that perhaps it is a demon. So, well, if you bump into me at night in the city and I don't say hello to you, please know it is not personal, but maybe you're a demon because I don't recognize you. <laughs> it's particularly not safe to walk outside on a Wednesday night and the night of the Sabbath. In Yalkut Chadash Kishafim 56, it states that you may encounter the dancing roof demon. Her name is Agrat Bat Machlat. She and her gang of 180,000 fellow demons can cause great harm. The text goes on to mention that one way to ensure the demons don't get you is to drink water from white vessels. I will discuss Agrat Bat Machlat a bit later in the book. One of the most dangerous times of the year, according to the rabbis, um, is 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. in the middle of the summer, more specifically the 17th of Tammuz to the 9th of Av. That corresponds to July 20th through August 10th, 2019. Plan accordingly. It is at this time a demon by the name of Ketev Meriri is at his strongest. He has the head of a calf with one oddly revolving horn in the center and an eye on his breast. His whole body is covered with scales and hairs and eyes. Whoever sees him, man or beast, falls down and expires. The Talmud at times describes demons as well in even more detail. In the text, demons assume the shape of humans. Uh, they have no shadows, or sometimes they have a shadow, but no shadow of shadows as we saw earlier. At times, it appears as a black goat-like being, or a seven-headed dragon as we saw, or serpent as we saw earlier. Apparently, not only are they dangerous, but they can also be consulted from time to time, as we've all done in the occult. Supposedly, they still can hear what is going on in the heavens, so they can relay this information to us. In Shabbat 101a, it states that the best way to consult them is by means of oil and eggshells. Only on Shabbat is this forbidden. Hillel and Jonathan ben Zakkai understood their talk just as King Solomon did. Let us just take a look at a few more. Shabbat 151b, it says, Rabbi Hanina said, It is prohibited to sleep alone in a house, and everyone who sleeps alone in a house will be seized by the evil spirit Lilith. As you can see, it was discouraged for men to sleep alone and fear that Lilith will kill him. This, as you know, was quite a fear back in those days, and even today, uh, many Jewish households have talisman against Lilith. The following is a description of what one must do in order to drink water from a lake or well. Apparently, it was not safe to do so because of the potential dangers of encountering a demon. Just look at how detailed this is. I mean, it boggles the mind. Pesachim 112a Lal, Shafan, Anigron, Anir Dafin, which are names of demons, I sit between the stars, I walk between thin and fat people. Take any of them if you wish, but leave me alone. And if he does not recall this incantation, if there is any person with him, he should wake him and say to him, So-and-so, son of so-and-so, I thirst for water, and then he may drink. And if there is no other person with him, he should knock the cover on the cup and then drink. 
and if he is not able to do this, he should throw some object in it and then drink. The sages taught a person should not drink water from rivers or from ponds at night, and if he drank, his blood is upon his own head due to the danger. The Talmud explains, why is this dangerous? The danger of blindness. The Gemara, or the Talmud, asks, And if he is thirsty, what is his remedy? If there is another person with him, he should say to him, So and so, son of so and so, I thirst for water. And if there is no one else with him, he should say to him, So and so to himself, So and so, my mother, said to me to be aware of Chavrire, the demon of blindness. He should continue to say the following incantation, in the first part of which the demon's name gradually disappears. Shavrire, verire, rire, yiri, ri. I thirst for water in white earthen cups. This is an incantation against these demons. Do you notice anything odd about the Shavrire, virire, rire, yiri, ri configuration? Aside from everything? <laughs> Uh, this is a magical incantation very similar to abracadabra in its form. If you are an occultist, I'm sure you have seen how abracadabra is often depicted in seals, in Hebrew and in English for that matter, and I will illustrate how the Chavrire incantation is very much the same. As the text states, it is used as an incantation against the demons of blindness, using the demon of blindness to remedy it. The reason the word slowly loses a letter is to represent the slow waning of the power of this demon. Another interesting aspect of Talmudic demonology is the idea that pairs of things is demonic and a source of very bad luck. This applies to everything. If you do anything twice, you will call the attention of demons and especially Ashmedai. You can't go to two weddings on the same day. If you were a, a judge, you can't pass the same sentence twice. Let us look at some of these scenarios. Pesachim 109b to 110b. A person should not eat in pairs, i.e. an even number of food items, and he should not drink pairs of cups, and he should not wipe himself with pairs, and he should not attend to his sexual needs in pairs. The concern was that one who uses pairs exposes himself to a sorcery and to demons. The sages taught in another passage, if one drinks in pairs, his blood is upon his head. Rav Yosef said, Yosef, the demon, said to me, Ashmedai, the king of demons, is appointed over all who perform actions in pairs. The text goes on and on about this in mind-numbing detail, as you can see. For some odd reason, doing anything in pairs should be avoided. Now here's where it gets even more amusing. There appears to be a way to avoid bad luck that is derived from the whole doing things in pairs thing. If a person forgot about not doing things in pairs and the demon Asmadius or Ashmedai comes to bring bad luck, the person would need to do the following. Pesachim 110a and b. And if one forgets and it happens that he goes outside after having drunk an even number of cups, what is his solution? The Talmud answers, He should take his right thumb in his left hand, his left thumb in his right hand, and say as follows, You, my thumbs, and I are three, which is not a pair. And if he hears a voice that says, You and I are four, which makes a pair, he should say to it, You and I are five. And if he hears it again, the voice, you and I are six, he should say to it, you and I are seven. The Talmud relates that there was an incident in which someone kept counting after the demon until he reached 101, and the demon burst into anger. Remember, kids, next time you do anything in pairs, make sure you follow that remedy above. Moving on. The word demon and other associated words are not the only terms used to describe demons. The Talmud uses another term for demons, and that is Angels of Destruction. We see this reference in Brachot 51a, Ketuvot 104a, Sanhedrin 106b. Let us take a look at one of these references. I will quote the entire passage so you can see just how precise these rabbis were when it came to avoiding the demonic. Brachot 51a. 
Rabbi Ishmael ben Elisha said, Suriel, the heavenly ministering angel of the divine presence, told me three things from on high. Do not take your cloak in the morning from the hand of your servant and wear it. Do not ritually wash your hands from one who has not ritually washed his own hands. And only return a cup of asparagus to the one who gave it to you. Why is this? Because a band of demons, some say a band of angels of destruction, lie in wait for a person and say, When will a person encounter one of these circumstances and be captured? In Aramaic, the term for uh, angels of destruction is Malke Chavala. This one example of washing of the hands and demonic influence is just the tip of the iceberg. Rabbinic literature is overrun with these references to demons and latching on to people with unwashed hands. For the sake of brevity, I won't illustrate other examples. I believe the one I supplied will suffice to get the point across. I will supply uh, several more verses from the Talmud regarding demons, and then we will move on. Pesachim 111b One who relieves himself on the stump of a palm tree would be seized by a spirit of pain of half his head, a migraine, and one who places his head on the stump of a palm tree will be seized by a spirit of sickness. One who walks over a palm tree, if the tree is cut down, he too will be killed. If that tree is uprooted, he will also be uprooted and die. Talmud comments, this statement applies only if he does not place his legs upon it. However, if he places his legs upon it, we have no problem with it. So, as you can see, it says spirit of pain in his head. And in Aramaic, it, uh, it says, uh, there's two terms, it's Ruach Palga and Ruach Zarda to describe these spirits. Ruach Palga literally means spirit of the divide or middle, thus pain in the middle of the head. Ruach Zarda literally means spirit of vertigo. I can see why the English translation did not originally translate these spirits literally, it, it wouldn't quite fit, but that is what those names mean if we were to translate them based on the text. In Bekorot 44b it states, The Mishnah teaches that one who is afflicted with a melancholy temper is disqualified from performing the temple service. The Talmud asks, What is this melancholy temper? Atana, or teacher, taught, A fallen spirit, the spirit of a demon, has come upon him. In Aramaic, there are two terms here for demons. The first is Ruach Ketzarit and Ruach Ben Nephilim. Here we have the term Ruach Ketzarit, which is a bit hard to translate. The root word is Ketzer, which can mean shortcut or short, as in a short fuse or something. they clearly trying to convey some kind of malfunction in a person. In English, the, they use the term melancholy. I have seen other translations where they actually use the term asthma. And the reason why some may use the term asthma is because instead of translating the term Ruach Kezarit as a signifier of a class of demons, they are literally translating the word Ruach, which can mean wind, air, or breath. Therefore, the person has shortness of air. In either case, the verse goes on to say that this condition is caused by fallen spirits or a demon. In Ketuvot 61b, it says, I saw a leprous spirit hovering over the food and realized that it had this defect. In Aramaic, it's Ruach Tzara'at, or as the translator actually states, spirit of leprosy. Chulin 107b states, Abaya said, the reason for the washing is not on account of the food specifically, rather it is due to an evil spirit named Shivta, who contaminates hands that have not been washed in the morning. As long as one washes his hands in the morning, perhaps he need not wash them again to feed another. In the Aramaic we have Shivta. To give some context, nearly this entire section, 107b, deals with various rules regarding the washing of hands, as I mentioned before, is a very big deal in the Talmud. They go back and forth about this, and Abaya chimes in to state that the reason it is important to wash one's hand is because of this evil spirit named Shivta, which is a, a feminine spirit. 
Uh, this is one of the few reasons why Orthodox Jews pray as they wash their hands in the morning. It is believed that unwashed hands are tainted. The term used is tum'ah, or impure. The root word is tameh. In Pesachim 11a, we see the Gemara cites a related statement. One who meets a woman when she is ascending from the ritual immersion of a mitzvah after her menstruation, if he has intercourse with any woman first, a spirit of immorality overtakes him. If she has intercourse first, a spirit of immorality overtakes her. Here we have a passage that is clearly discussing a sexual matter during the menstrual cycle. The demon class in this text is Ruach Zinonim. This literally means spirits of sexual desire. As you can see in the Talmud, there are many references to demons, and I will return to the Talmud in a moment, but I want to now turn our attention to a group of Jewish texts called the Targumim. The purpose of these texts is to translate the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic. The reason for this is due to the fact that many Jews of the rabbinic period didn't know Hebrew well. They were fluent in Aramaic. The Targumim are also a font of wisdom because they don't often translate the text verbatim, but add commentary as well. In the next uh, few passages, we will see other classes of demons we did not discuss yet. There were several other classes of demons that were often equated with the main four that we discussed earlier in the book. In some instances, it diverged from them. You then have demons that have more specific purpose, such as the ones that bring natural disasters as well as sickness, uh, and we saw a few of those earlier as well. Uh, let us take a look at these additional demon classes as portrayed in the Targumim. Targum, Jonathan, Deuteronomy 32, verses 23 to 24. And when they dwell in Babel, they will serve their idols, for I have spoken in my word to array calamities upon them, the plague arrows of my vengeance to destroy them. I will make them go into captivity in Medea, and Elam, and the captivity of Babel, and the house of Agag, and who are like demons gaping with famine, and to corpses devoured by birds and to stricken evil spirits of the noon, to Lilin, and to the spirits big with evil. As you can see, the there are several different demon classes here. You have the noon spirits, you have the Lilin, which is the night demons that Lilith comes from, and you have uh, something called the uh, Ruach Bishin, which is spirits big with evil. The correct translation is really spirits that bring sickness. Well, thank you for enduring this chapter. I know it was a lot. I felt it was necessary to give you a broad, but at the very same time, a detailed view of how early Judaism during the post-biblical period perceived demons. There is so much more, but I would never get this book done if I itemized each occurrence of demons in the rabbinic texts. Let's move on. There you have it, my friends, a chapter from my latest book. It is currently in pre-release. You can get it on Kindle, and uh, when it does finally come out, it'll just download to your device. The paperback will be available probably the same day, and the audio about a week or two after that. Uh, this is, again, the longest text I've written, and I'm not even close to finishing it, and I've been working on this, you know, day and night, pretty much. And the chapter that I just read you may go through another revision. I might add a few things. I'm not going to take anything out, but I'll, I, I might add. Uh, but you see, I try to keep it a little light because some of it is pretty funny, uh, if not completely ridiculous. And so the entire book pretty much uh, goes from m very general ideas to more uh, specific ones. So what you just read was pretty much towards the beginning of the book, uh, or what you would just heard so it's pretty general and then it, it, it'll, it'll get more specific as the book goes on um, I think you'll really enjoy it again uh, I haven't found any book right now on the market that um, contains all of this information in one place uh, so this has really been a labor of love it's been also very tiring I, I, I don't know if you can hear it in my voice because I've been recording pretty much all day and uh, uh, writing as well. And so, you know, it takes a little bit of a uh, little energy out of you after a while. 
And uh, there you have it. So I hope you enjoyed it. Again, I know it was a little long, but it it just gives you an idea of just how you know big this topic actually is. And uh, that's about it. Um, I'm going to rest up right now, and I'll be back at it tomorrow morning. I hope you guys have a great weekend, and I will talk to you soon. So mote it be.